Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Welcome back to Basketball History 101. This is Rick Loiza and with me is Jacob. Hey Jacob, how's it going? Good, how are you dad? Doing well. So today's story is on the betting scandal from 1951 involving CCNY and a bunch of other schools and players. So obviously you're going to talk about what exactly happened during the scandal, but Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of wanted to ask you, what made this story important? What stuck out to you that you thought it would be worth an episode of Basketball History 101? Well, one of the things that stuck out to me about this story was the fact that you see uh, this cheating going on with these players and the gamblers. That's something that a lot of current basketball fans think that this is something that only would happen today but this really goes back as far as sports go at different levels people try to manipulate sports if you even go all the way back to the ancient olympics uh they had situations where people tried to manipulate the outcome of events you know thousands of years ago anywhere where you can place a bet or you can make money by placing a bet and you can get the outcome to go your way then there's an opportunity there. And this was, at the time, the biggest scandal of its kind in college basketball. So that's where I wanted to start. There is another one that happens 10 years later, and that's gonna be a future episode. But yeah, this one was just really, really big and involved a lot of people in a lot of schools. Okay, so why should our listeners today care about this story? Part of it, I wanted to approach the story from the idea of just trying to maintain the concept of fair play. That when you're playing sports, no matter whether it's basketball or something else, that you compete honestly, that you compete uh, with 100% effort to try to win the game as honestly as possible. I think that's important. I think that's something that hopefully most of the listeners would agree with. And this story is just kind of a cautionary tale of how easily something like this can happen. So, obviously, it had an impact in its day, but then you mentioned there's another one 10 years later. So, while it apparently had an impact, why didn't it have enough of an impact to prevent the one 10 years later? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, the impact it had, because it is illegal to manipulate the outcome of sports games in the, in the United States, it is illegal. What happens 10 years later, actually, there's actually a connection really, to one of the people involved in 1951 is part of the scandal in 1961, wow. where basically they said, we're going to do it again, but this time I'm going to be more careful about it. But obviously that they got caught too. Well, that sounds really interesting. That'll uh, give our listeners something to look forward to. Yeah, hopefully. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. All right. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back, aficionados. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we're going to talk about the betting scandal in 1951 that primarily involved City College of New York, or CCNY. It also involved six other schools and over 30 players. But let me start with some background. There is a concept in sports called point shaving. It is completely illegal. In the United States, it is a federal crime to manipulate the outcome of a sports competition. In fact, it's illegal in most countries. Here, it comes under the jurisdiction of the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And here's how it works. A player, usually a superstar, works to keep the score close in order to benefit a gambler. 
You see, in basketball, as in many other sports, there is something called a point spread. This helps keep the game even for the purposes of betting. Here's a hypothetical example. Let's say that Duke University, a current powerhouse, is playing Lafayette College from Pennsylvania. Lafayette doesn't even offer basketball scholarships, so they get players who are actually there to earn a degree and just want to keep playing some basketball for as long as they can. These are not players with any delusions of ever becoming professional basketball players. While on the other hand, Duke attracts some of the best high school players in the country year after year. In fact, Duke has 25 of its former players in the NBA right now. That's almost one for every team. So if these two schools are going to play each other and you had to make a bet on who was going to win, you would for sure put your money on Duke to win the game. Everybody would. It's a no-brainer. But this isn't good for the gambling houses like the ones you find in Las Vegas or on the internet. It doesn't make sense for them to take this particular bet because everybody would bet on Duke. Duke would win the game and all the bettors would double their money, meaning that the gambling house would lose a ton of money on this kind of game. So in order for the gambling house not to lose all that money, they offer a point spread. They will say something like, Duke is a 14 and a half point favorite. That means that you either add 14 and a half points to Lafayette's point total at the end of the game, or you subtract 14 and a half points from Duke's point total. Either way, you get the same outcome. To keep it simple, let's say you add the points to Lafayette's score. So now comes the night of the actual game. Duke has some trouble, but they still win the game 70 to 58. Well, that's a 12 point victory as far as the actual game is concerned. But once you add those 14 and a half points to Lafayette's total, their total becomes 72 and a half, which is more than the 70 that Duke actually scored. This means that for the purposes of betting, Lafayette wins the bet. Anybody who bet on Lafayette doubles their money. Anyone who bet on Duke would lose because Duke did not win the game by at least 14 and a half points. So here's where an opportunity comes up for a professional gambler. Hypothetically speaking, here's how it goes. A professional gambler will approach the superstar of a powerhouse school. He offers the superstar $1,000 to keep the score below the point spread. They can still win the game, but it has to be close. After paying the $1,000 to the player, the professional gambler will then place a huge, huge bet on the other team to win when you add the point spread. The superstar makes sure that the game stays close by making a bad pass here or missing a free throw there, as long as it's not obvious what he's trying to do. What the professional gambler is doing is called fixing the game. They are paying money to a player or players to help ensure a specific outcome so that they can then place a bet on that outcome and win big. And this kind of thing has happened in all kinds of sports over the years. Back in 1919, the Chicago White Sox purposely lost the World Series to the Cincinnati Reds after eight of their players were paid by professional gamblers to lose the series. That incident is still referred to as the famous Black Sox scandal. And there's actually a really great movie about it called Eight Men Out. The fixing of games has also popped up in professional soccer in Italy, in badminton in Indonesia, and it even happened in the NBA when former referee Tim Donaghy was caught manipulating the outcomes of games on behalf of organized crime. Donaghy went to prison for it. So, now that we know how game fixing works, let's go back to CCNY. The year is 1950, and CCNY became, and still, the only team to win the NCAA tournament and the NIT tournament in the same year. Well, no team can do that today since both tournaments are held at the same time. You are either in one or the other, but never both. 
CCNY was an absolute powerhouse in the 1930s and 40s under the guidance of coach Nat Holman. Well, it turns out that members of organized crime had approached the three stars from CCNY, All-American Ed Warner, along with teammates Ed Roman and Al Roth. All three agree to shave points and keep the scores close in exchange for cash payments. They were the best team in the country. The players were fully confident that they could keep the scores close, but still win every game. And so that's what they did for the next year. They were winning games, after all they were still considered the best team in the country, and the three stars were making money on the side for their efforts. It was all going well for the people involved. And basically, different gamblers were going around to different schools in the New York area and recruiting the team's star to join in on the scam. Then the star would recruit one or two other teammates to help out. The following year, on February 18, 1951, all three of these CCNY stars were arrested at Penn Station in New York upon returning from a road game where they beat Temple University in Philadelphia. These arrests ended their college playing careers. In fact, it ended their professional careers before they even started. The NBA and other smaller leagues could not risk damaging their own reputation by taking in players that were known cheaters. Even today, if a player gets caught point shaving, it usually means a lifetime ban. But how did they get caught? I mean, this is not the kind of thing you talk about. Everybody involved definitely had an incentive to keep it secret. Well, I'll explain how they got caught right after this break. Welcome back. And now we're going to talk about how they got caught with this point shaving scam. We'll start with a guy named Hank Pop, who had recently graduated from Manhattan College, where he played on the basketball team and shaved points in exchange for cash. Now that he was no longer in college, he had become a recruiter for the gamblers. He approached a former teammate by the name of Junius Kellogg. Kellogg was six foot eight and the new star for Manhattan since Pop had graduated. Pop offered him a thousand dollars to fix an upcoming game against DePaul University. Now in 1950, a thousand dollars is the same as $10,000 in the year 2020. And Kellogg could have used the money. Kellogg was a bit older than your typical college basketball player. He had already served in the military and was attending Manhattan on the GI Bill, which in the United States is a program where former soldiers can have some or all of their college paid for. At the time, Kellogg was working for minimum wage at an ice cream shop to help work his way through college. Thankfully, he was a man of integrity. He initially accepted the arrangement, but he reported it immediately to his coach, Ken Norton. His coach then brought in the local district attorney. Kellogg was asked to wear a wire or a hidden recording device in order to get Pop on tape. That would be the evidence they needed to break open this case. And as expected, he was approached again for a follow-up meeting. But this time, he has the whole conversation on tape. And from there, it really began to unravel. Those involved began to give each other up. Now, you've seen this kind of thing on a thousand different episodes of detective shows. It usually goes something like this. We know you were involved. We have you on tape to prove it. So give us the names of everybody else involved and we'll go easy on you. Well, that's all it took for the suspects to start spilling their guts. By the time the investigation was over, over 32 players and a bunch of professional gamblers were arrested for fixing games between 1947 and 1950. One of the main leaders of the scam was a man named Salvatore Salazzo, a known criminal with connections to organized crime. Besides CCNY, the other schools involved in this particular gambling ring were New York University, Long Island University, Manhattan College, Bradley University in Illinois, the University of Kentucky, and the University of Toledo. Now, what these schools had in common 
is that they were either New York area schools or they often traveled to New York for games or tournaments like the annual NIT tournament. The whole thing was based out of New York. The scandal was devastating to all of these schools, except Kentucky. The other schools all began to de-emphasize sports and put more effort into promoting their academic offerings. None of them are basketball power schools anymore. At the time, these were some of the best basketball schools in the country. CCNY plays at the Division III level of college basketball today. These former powerhouses simply could not recover from this scandal. In most cases, the schools cut their athletic budget, combined with the fact that none of the good players wanted to go there anymore. It just wasn't worth the risk to their reputation. As I mentioned, Kentucky was the only exception. Adolph Rupp was their coach and had nothing to do with what these players were involved in. After completely canceling the 1952-53 season, they were able to come back from the sheer power of his personality and skill as a recruiter. He cleaned house and was back in the top 10 in no time. But the scandal as a whole nearly killed college basketball. Fans weren't sure who was playing honestly and who was point shaving. There were just too many players across too many schools. Every turnover and missed free throw was suspect. If a player averaged 18 points a game and suddenly scores only 6, rumors would start. It also didn't help that in 1961, an even bigger scandal emerged involving 50 players from 27 schools. But that's a story for a future episode. But today, there are certain safeguards against this type of activity. One thing that every major school does is they have a team of monitors that work within the athletic department to make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen again. As much as possible, they try to keep up with who the players are associating with. Schools cannot afford to be caught point shaving. Also, the legal gambling houses use computers to track any betting that strays from the norm. Now, let's go back to our hypothetical example that we used at the beginning of the episode, Duke against Lafayette College. That is the type of game that might only bring in $200,000 in total betting across the entire country. But if the house suddenly sees a game like this with, let's say, $1 million in betting, in other words, if they see five times the normal amount of betting for a game of this type, then the computer sounds the alarm and all betting on this particular game is cancelled. All the customers get refunds and the game is taken down from the betting board. The game still happens in real life, but legal gambling houses shut it down for the purposes of betting. But what would make a kid agree to shave points in the first place? Most college athletes come from modest means and something in the neighborhood of $10,000 in today's money can sure go a long way and it is extremely tempting. Besides, it's not like they're taking money to lose the game, they just need to keep it close but they can still win. So where's the harm? I mean, that's the way the thinking goes. It's obviously still cheating and is completely wrong. Thankfully, these types of incidents don't happen as often anymore since more and more safeguards have been put into place to prevent them. I hope that something like this never happens again. I love this game and I don't want to see it tainted in this way. And hopefully you feel the same way. It's also just not worth it. Every one of those players from the 1951 incident were banned from playing professional basketball where they could have made way more money in salary than what they received for shaving points. Not only was it a bad moral decision to participate in this scam, but it turns out it was also a bad financial decision as they inadvertently sacrificed a future career in the NBA. That's our story for today. Join us next time as we cover more NBA nicknames, we will cover the Northwest Division where we will find out how the following teams got their nicknames. The Denver Nuggets, Minnesota Timberwolves, Oklahoma City Thunder, Portland Trailblazers, and the Utah Jazz. That's next time on Basketball History 101. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. 
and check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. So I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.